Aloha and good evening. Welcome to Middle Earth Storytime. My name is Edwin Boyant. I'll be your narrator. Narrator this evening. I'm joined by the artist and illustrator El Rodimus Flash. It is our pleasure to present to you a random background noise. Uh, <laughs> it is our pleasure to present to you Moss Flower, a tale of Redwall by Brian Jakes. Let me say hello to the live audience. Let's see. Make sure I'm in live chat. Okay, it looks like George Thaddeus was the first to log in. George Thaddeus. What would be what would be a good title? What would be a good title? George Thaddeus, Scourge of the Seas, Scourge of the Seas, Terror of the Seas, Long May He Reign. <laughs> we ended the chapter, of course, with a little, little <laughs> nautical battle of sorts, a little boat boarding by our fellowship as, as Boar the Fighter made his tragic stand on the shores of Salamandrstrand. George, good to see you. And George says, Rip Feldo, Rip Hilgors, lived as free beast, died as warriors. <laughs> Amy Lester in the chat says, You live on in the hearts of all Redwall, brave fallen heroes. <laughs> all right. All right. With that said, we are, of course, reading Mossflower, a tale of Redwall by Brian Jenks. If you do come in later, please say hello, or if you're watching this as a replay later on, please do leave us a comment. We'd love to hear from the audience. Uh, just a bit more coffee. I'm just waking up from a bit of an afternoon nap, and, and this coffee is absolute nectar, if you will. <laughs> Ah, uh, excellent. Excellent. All right. We are reading Mossflower, Tale of Redwall by Brian Jakes. We resume in Chapter 42. Dawn brushed pale streaks of pink and gold through the gray mist on the calm sea waters. Rasping sounds from a file could be heard on deck from the ore banks below. Gomph was freeing the slaves. Martin and Denny assisted the pathetic creatures on to the deck. Some of them had not seen daylight in seasons. They were a mixed bunch. Ragged shrews and emaciated mice together with some bedraggled hedgehogs and the odd gaunt squirrel. How could any creature treat another in this cruel manner? Martin wondered. It made his blood boil as he tended them. Denny was doling out food from Bloodwake's well-stocked pantries. Yer, get some vittles down ye. Usin's fatten ye up. Martin was supporting a tough mouse who seemed on the verge of collapse. Thank you, Martin, son of Luke, he said, nodding gratefully at the young warrior. Martin's paws gave way. He sank to the deck of Bloodwake taking his burden with him. They sat staring at each other. Martin could only find one word to say. Timbalisto. Tears ran freely down the mouse's whisker. Martin, my friend. A shrew who sat gnawing at a ship's biscuit came and sat by them. Martin, the young warrior mouse, eh? Tim Blisto here was always talking about you. Tim Blisto threw a paw about his friend's shoulder. How did you know I was aboard this floating rat trap? Martin hugged him. I didn't, you old war dog. I thought you'd gone to the gates of Dark Forest long ago, fighting enemies off outside our caves in the Northlands. As they sat talking, Logalog came from Ripfang's cabin aft. He was studying some sailcloth charts. Immediately, a great shout went up from the shrews who had been free. Log a log! Chief! It's us! The old gang from the village! 
preoccupied with something he had discovered among the maps. The shrew chief waved distractively to them. Ha! Ah, hello, you lot. Well, eat up and get fit again. Boss is back now. Told you I'd rescue you, didn't I? Gomp heaved himself up from the galley banks below. Woo, matey. You could do with a good scrub down there. Hey, log log. Found some booty. The shrew spread charts upon the deck. Look, it's all here. The way home. Martin could make little of the charts. Show me. Righto. It's simple, really. See here that Salamandestrin, Logalog explained. Keep the setting sun to your left, and follow the coastline until we sight a river flowing into the sea from the right. It's the River Moss, see? Flowing from east to west. Denny's digging paw tapped the canvas. Er, well, I never did. Stand on my tunnel. It be our river it flows through moss floor. Look it. There be woodlands marking up over yon. Burr, ye rat bag knowed it all. Logalog pinned the canvas down against a breeze that was springing up. I'll say he did. That's how he came to capture my tribe. There's our village marked on the northeast fringes of moss flower. Bank snout. Shin up the mast and keep your eyes busy for the river flowing in from landward. Gonf, take the tiller and hold it seaward a point to bring us closer into shores. Shrews, break out all sail so we catch this good breeze. Under the eyes of the summer sun, Bloodwake scudded across the foaming whitecaps like a great seabird. Timbalisto leaned over the deck rail with Martin. I wish I had the chance to meet Bor the fighter, Timbalisto sighed. He sounds like a great warrior from what you say. What a pity he won't be coming back to save Mossflower. Martin drew his sword. It's my duty to save Mossflower. I swore it to Bor, and I intend keeping that oath. Timbalisto watched him as he held forth the beautiful blade. Oh, you will, Martin. You will. A hedgehog poked his head around the door of the forward cabins. Oi, there's a full armory here, lads. Swords, spears, knives. Everything an army could wish for. Gird loads of vittles, too, Denny chuckled. I tell ye, Gonfin. Little boats make I sick. <laughs> but this one's a nice big shipper. I'll call her Woodship. Har, that'd be a fine name. Gump watched the four, pe the four peak responding to the tiller. Woodship it is then, Din. Though personally, I'd have named her Columbine. Trubs and the company chimed in. I say, that's a bit strong, Gump would say there. Has Columbine really got a wooden bottom? And two ears that stick out like sails? They narrowly dunked the pail of seawater that Gomp hurled. Bunk bank snout roared out in gruff shrew bass from atop the rigging. Oi! River up in sight! North to landward! Martin climbed the bowsprit. Browsprit. He stood up on the bleached fish skull figurehead looking eagerly. Sure enough, there was the river boiling across the shores in the distance. He turned to the crowd of eager faces watching him. Take her head up and round the shore, Gump. We're going home. Shrews, mice, hedgehogs, squirrels, hares, and a single mole roared out in a voice that rang across the waves. Moss flower! Chapter 43 <laughs> Sitting on his high spruce perch, excuse me, chapter 43, Aguilar was awake. Sitting on his high spruce perch, he glared down greedily through his old watery eyes at the red-cloaked figure crossing the parade ground of Cotier. At last, P 
Pine Marten. Sarmina pushed hard against the gates. See, they're rocking on their hinges, she pointed out to Bane. Those woodlanders have been meddling with them. I'm sure of it. Bane gave the gates a kick. Do you think so? They seem solid enough to me. Ha! Even fire arrows didn't make much impression on these gates. Sarmina unbolted the locks. Opening the gates cautiously, she peered around them at the woodlands. It was safe. All clear out here, but I don't like it. I'm sure they've done something to these hinges from outside. Just think, if these gates blew down during the autumn, we'd be at their mercy. Ha! Huh. I don't know what you're fussing about, Bane said swirling his new coat, new cloak impatiently. These gates look all right to me. Sarmina gnawed her lip. Are you really sure, though? The fox sighed in its aspiration. Oh, I suppose I'll have to go and take a look to keep you happy. He strode briskly outside. Sarmina dodged inside, slamming the gates and bolting them. Bane was puzzled momentarily. Oi, what's the matter with you, Sarmina? There was no reply. Sarmina was racing across the parade ground to watch from her high window. Suddenly Bane sensed he had been tricked, but it was too late. Argula had already launched himself from his perch. He homed in on the red-cloaked figure like a bolt from the blue. On the other side of Kotir, Bane's mercenaries worked away on the scullery door, blissfully unaware of what was taking place outside. Bane did not see the eagle swoop. He was trying to find pawholds as he clambered up the oaken gates. Argyra struck him hard from behind, bearing powerful talons and vicious hooked beak in the prey that had eluded him for so long. The fox was transfixed, frozen with cruel agony. But as the eagle started to carry him off, Bane's fighting instincts took over. Freeing his curved sword, he struck upward at the feathered enemy. The sword hit Argula once, twice. Doggedly, the great eagle talons and beak sank deeper into his prey. We'll let that pass by. Background noise. <coughs> Pardon me. <coughs> and hello, Melissa Lester. I see you in chat. We're just waiting for some of that background noise to f fade away. Doggedly, the great eagle sank talons and beak deeper into his prey, beating the air with his massive wing spread as he did. Both hunter and quarry rose skyward. Sarmina at her wisdom window danced up and down in fiendish glee. Attracted by the screams, the occupants of Kotur looked up. Bane slashed wildly with his sword. Argula stabbed madly with his beak. All the while the combatants rose higher, and soon they were above the treetops. Chib fluttered in circles some distance away. He watched the amazing sight as eagle and fox rose into the sky. Thor above Mossflower. Argula won the battle. Bane gave a final shudder and went limp, the curved sword falling from his lifeless paws. The ancient eagle felt cheated. This was no pine marten. It was a fox. Argula's heart sank in his breast. It did not rise again. The roomy eyes shut in the same instant as the great wings folded in death, and only the talons remained fixed deep into the dead fox. Sarmina watched as both creatures plunged earthward, two enemies defeated in a single brilliant smoke stroke. Ratflank dashed for the gate. Brog shouted after him, Where do you think you're off to? <laughs> to get the cloak, of course. That's a good bit of velvet. It can be repaired, you know. Get back here, frog brain. See what happened to that fox? He wore the cloak. 
Do you want the same thing happening to yourself? Frog brain yourself, dimwit. Can't you see the eagle's dead? Any creature can wear that cloak now. Oi, don't you call me dimwit, droopy whiskers. I'll call you what I like, dimwit. Knit ears, fat nose. So Mina smiled inwardly. A third victory today. Now that she heard Ratflank shouting, she could identify the insolent voice that had often insulted her from the protection of the ranks or the bottom of a curved stairwell. Later that day, she instructed Brog, Take Ratflank and find the bodies of the eagle and the fox. Yes, my lady. Shall I bring them back here? No, Brog. Bury them. As you say, my lady. Oh, and Brog. Yes, my lady. How do you feel about that insolent rat flank these days? Oh, him. He's a cheeky beast, my lady. Call me lots of nasty names. Yes, me too. How would you like to bury him with the fox and the eagle? <laughs> Brock chortled. Can I, my lady? Yes, but not a word to any creature about it. Can I have the red cloak too, my lady? Yes, if you want it. And Bane's curved sword, my lady? Brock pressed her. If you can find it. Where do you think it fell, my lady? Sarmina turned her eyes upwards as if seeking patience. Brog, I wouldn't know where the sword fell, or the eagle, or the fox. Just get out of my sight, and don't bother me with the details. But what about... Yes, my lady. Earthcrawl was first to reach the underground foundations of Kotor. Standing steadily, he made his way along the underground well until he met up with Billum. Together they continued until they linked up with Soyflyer, who was waiting for them. Burr, day to e, moles, he greeted them. Four mo and ow dinny be along with two soon. Usins can break through rock then. Lady Amber had sunk the floodgates at the other end of the tunnels. They were to be lifted by rope hoist attached to rock counterweights over high branches. Skipper and his f crew had dug fresh tunnels from the river, sloping down to meet the floodgates which separated them from the main tunnels. All the workings had been shorn up with stone and timber. Four moles supervised the removal of rocks from the foundations of Couture. The moles pried away the soft, damp stones with bars and chisels until they felt cold, fetid air on their snouts. Brrr, this dirty old place needin' a girt barth. <laughs> Shortly before nightfall, the moles climbed out of the tunnel workings, back in Mossflower, where the woodlanders and quorum leaders had assembled. Bella rolled three large rocks of the holes from which the moles had emerged. Others moved in to pack the bung rocks firmly in with wood and soil. Now everything was ready. Between the lower depths of Couture and the distant river and mossflower woods, all that stood was three timber sluice gates. Lady Amber laid her tail flat on the lower branches of a sycamore. The woodlanders held their breath. Skipper nodded to Formal. Formal nodded to Bella. Bella nodded to Amber. The squirrel's tail rose like a starter's flag. There was a creaking of rope pulleys as squirrels launched the rocks from the high trees, riding down to earth on them, holding to the ropes. The counterweights traveled fast, humming across the heavily beeswax branches. The wooden floodgates had made a squelching sound as they were pulled free of the earth. Then water began rippling through into the tunnels. The flooding of Kultura had begun. It brings us to chapter 44. Why don't we have an intermission here?
and then we will continue. Let's see. Bum 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 bum. Ah. Interesting. Let's see. New playlist. Christmas. Can I make a Christmas playlist? That'd be cool. That'd be coolio. Okay. All right. One item added to. Okay. Add files. Add files to play here. Okay. Well. Is it working? Maybe. Bum 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 I'm finding Christmas music for you. Let's see if that worked. Yeah, I think it did. I think it did. And let's see. Repeat all. Okay, here we go. I think. Let's see. Ah, there we go. All right, a short intermission, and then story time will continue.
Good King Wenceslas looked out on the face of Stephen When the snow lay round about, deep and crisp and even Brightly shone the moon at night, though the frost was cruel When a poor man came in sight, gathering winter fuel Hither, patient, stand by me, if thou snow is telling Yonder peasant to his he, wherein what is dwelling Sorry leaves a goodly cans underneath a mountain Right against the forest fence, by St. Agnes Fountain Bring me flesh and bring me wine, bring me fine locks hither Thou and I shall see him dine, when we bear him thither Page and man are forth they went, forth they went together Through the rude winds, wild lament, and the bitter weather So the night is darker now, and the wind blows stronger There's my heart, I know not how, I can go no longer Mark my footsteps, my good pace, tread thou in them boldly Thou shalt find the winter's rage, freeze thy bloodless coolly in his master's steps he trod, where the snow lay dinted He was in the very side, which the saint had printed Therefore, Christian men be sure of the ring possessing He who now shall bless the poor Shall yourselves find blessing And what about now? Do I... But I can't... Boom, boom, boom. All right, I'll just make certain that, that I can be heard before before I get into anything of substance. Okay, you hear sound, yeah. So Good King Wenceslas is one of my favorite. I do need to find a version of White Christmas that we can play. Oh, maybe Silent Night, right? Silent Night, that is absolutely one of my favorites too. Let's see. Let's say hello to some people before we resume before we resume our festivities, let's see. Hey, I see. Hi, man. I'm Bob. Good to see you here. I see Roxanne. Uh, Roxanna Bell Cohen. I like that name. She says, I always love the singing the song in choir. It's just sort of fun and catchy. Yes. All right. Apparently that Christmas carol made Roxanne Bell jump. My apologies. I did not mean to startle you with a Christmas carol. Roxanne Bell said, I I was at home today and doing no work. I was like, yeah, not going to be late this time. And then I fell asleep. It happens. It happens. I think I've, I've accidentally overslept story time myself. I was like, hmm, I'll get a nap in. And then realized... Sometime after story time, time that I had not set an alarm. <laughs> I may have done that once myself. All right. We are reading Moss Flower, A Tale of Red Wall by Brian Jakes. Well, the, the Woodlanders, Corum, Corum, if you will, have resumed their plan to flood out to flood out the castle Cotier. They've dug their tunnels. They've lifted the sluice gate. We shall see what happens. And Martin now finds himself the captain 
the captain of one ship, <laughs> so named by, so named by Denny. <laughs> we resume in chapter 44. Driving Woodship inland against the flow of the River Mons was a difficult task. All poles manned the oar banks, and Martin sat alongside Tim Ballisto. Phew! I never realized rowing was such heavy work, Martin groaned. Pool, my friend, pool. It's twice as bad when you have to do it on half rations, with a sea rat's whip cracking about your ears, and you're chained to the oar. The vessel had been built for coast raiding. Though it was a large craft, it had a flat bottom for taking shallow draught, and it was able to travel upriver without a deep keel sticking in the shallows. Inland they traveled, sometimes aided by a breeze when the sails were hoisted. Other times saw two teams dragging a ford on head ropes from the river banks. It took a day and a half of hard work to get across the flat beach and into the dunes where the river was tighter channeled and flowed faster against them. Logalog solved the problem by using the long galley oars from the deck. Two crew to each oar, they punted and pushed Woodship through the dunes, keeping her head upriver with great difficulty. Gradually, the dunes gave way to hilly scrubland, and the sand began to disappear. It was a weary crew that sat upon that bank that night, watching the ship riding at anchor. Gomp heard a clod of earth at the fast-flowing water. We'll never make it this way, mateys. Why not abandon ship and march the rest of the way? Harebell and the company smiled sweetly. Oh, you are a silly, Mr. Gomp. We must take the ship. The river flows back to the sea, you see. And we may need that to make a quick getaway if we are pushed. Martin winked at Gomp. The ladies certainly know their strategy. By the way, has anyone seen Logalog, Big Club? As if in answer, the shrew strode up on the gathering gloom. Aye, aye, I've been scouting ahead. Found the old village, too. Come on, you lucky lot. There'll be a hot meal and a warm bed with a roof overhead tonight. Bank snout, you wouldn't recognize your little ones now. They're taller than me. Oh, Martin, I forgot to tell you. We've gained another hundred able furred recruits. Delight awaited them at the Shrew Village as families were reunited amidst cheering and shouting. Daddy, Daddy, it's me, Emily, your baby Shrewlet. Ho, oh, ho, look at you. You're bigger than your mom. Sharptail, you said you were going for acorns. That was four seasons ago. Where have you been? Sorry, my dear. Sea rats, you know. What's this? Grand shrew babies? Aye, you're a grandpa shrew now. By the fur. Here, give me a hold of that little fat feller. Glugga bugger lugga loo. Ha ha ha. See, he knows me already. The hares joined Martin and the others around a fire. Two plump shrews served them with hot fruit pie, dandelion salad, and bowls of fresh milk. Gomp sang around a mouthful of hot pie. Oh, the wood ship is a good ship, and we'll sell her anywhere. Rode by mice and crewed by shrews, and often steered by hare. So host the, host the anchor and loose the sails. Give me a wind that never fails, and we'll sail the good ship, wood ship, from here to Old Brock Hall. He had to sing it twice again while the shrews danced a hornpipe with the hares. As the fires burned below, they settled back with full stomachs and renewed hope for the morn. Martin and Tim Ballisto slept side by side beneath the stars, each wrapped in a colorfully woven shrew blanket. Denny dug a flattish hole for the hares. Oh, thank you kindly, Mr. Mole. Such charming manners and swift digging. Ooh, and that beautiful velvety fur and strong claws. 
Denny wrinkled his face and tugged his snout, slightly embarrassed. Brrrr, <laughs> blessy, bain't no but an old old missies. The moon rose like a white china plate over the peaceful scene on the banks of the river Moss. Sarmina faced the troops gathered in the large mess hall. She had specially arranged the gathering by sending Bain's former mercenaries, mercenaries in first. Her own soldiers, led by Brog in his red velvet cloak, ring the mercenaries by jostling them to the center of the floor. Brog held up Bain's curved sword for silence as the Wildcat Queen addressed the assembly. Bain is dead. Those who served under him have nowhere left to go now. Move from here and you do it without supplies or weapons. Besides, those woodlanders out there would take care of you in short order. Any creature want to say something? There was silence. Right, she continued commandingly. From now on you take your orders from me. Brog will see you get rations and a bill at each. Later I'll see about appointing more officers and getting you some proper uniforms. Take over, Brog. The weasel captain stepped up, twirling his new sword. All together now. Hail Salmina, Queen of Mossflower. The response was less than enthusiastic. Sarmina made them repeat it until she was satisfied. That's better. You can learn my list of titles later. They stood in awkward silence, not knowing what to do next. In the hush that followed, Sarmina's ears rose visibly. Something was beginning to disturb her. Dismissed all of you. Brog, you stay with me. When the hall was emptied, she turned to Brog with haunted eyes. Listen, can you hear it? She asked fearfully. I can't hear a thing, my lady. Listen, it's water flowing, dripping, spilling somewhere. Brog gave a careful ear. Suddenly he brightened up. Ah, yes, I, I, I can hear it now, my lady. You're right. There is water about somewhere. Damp, do you think? The sound of water produced so distressing an effect upon Sarmina that she forgot to chide Brog. She cowered in a corner, paws covering her ears to shut out the dreaded noise. Flowing water, seeping water, creeping water, dark, icy, swirling water. Brog, quick! Get as many troops together as you can, she ordered desperately. Find out where that water is coming from and stop it. Stop it. Brog saw the terror on his queen's face and fled the room. The whole of the garrison searched high and low, but not too low. Nobody, including Brog, was over keen to venture beneath the sails. Down there it was dark and cold. Down there was the lake where Gloomer used to be kept, and goodness knows what else. That night, as Sarmina sat huddled in her chamber, dripping water echoed in her imagination, never letting up. When the fear of water was upon her, the daughter of Verdoga was no longer queen of Mossflower, lady of the thousand eyes, or ruler of Couture. She was reduced to a crazed, terrified kitten, trembling at the sound of dripping water in the darkness, longing for morning light to come stealing over the horizon. Something had gone radically wrong with the flooding. Bella slumped in the grass by the river with Skipper. No joy, Morm, he asked solicitously. I'm afraid not, Skipper. There seems to be only a trickle going down the tunnels. Lady Amber joined the pair. Aye, it seemed to be going so well at first. Do you think because it's summer and we haven't had much rain, she suggested. Skipper chewed a blade of grass. Maybe so. There's not a lot we can do about it anyway. 
Maybe we could dam the river? Bella offered tentatively. Impossible, Marm, the skipper of otters snorted. Damn the river, Moss! Stole me barnacles! You couldn't hope to stop a river that size from flowing to the sea. Columbine stopped by to join the discussion. Perhaps it will feel gradually. Aye, missy, skipper chuckled dryly. We could all sit here growing old and watch it doing just that. No, we'll give it a bit more time. Then if things are still the same, we'll have to think of another scheme. Lady Amber whacked her tail down irritably. After all that underwater digging and tunneling, then there's the lives that were lost too. Ah, it makes me mad. The river carried on flowing its normal course, only a thin trickle diverting down the flood tunnels. It was the evening of the following day. Abish, Germain, and Columbine were helping Ben Stickle to take out the little ones for an evening stroll along the riverbank. Ferdy and Cogs played with Spike and Posey, together with some young mice. They were selling miniature boats that Ben had made for them. Germain watched them fondly as the young ones dashed boisterously up and down the bank, bursting with energy after being confined to Brockhall the past few days. Be careful, Spike. Watch you don't fall in, she called. See my boat, Abbas. It's faster than cogs. Oh, look, Ferdy is cheating. He's pushing his boat with a stick. No, I'm not. It's the wind. Mine has a bigger sail. Columbine, mine has gone down the hole. Can you get it back for me, please? Sorry, Spike. It's gone for good now. Never mind. I'm sure Ben will make you another. Ben Stickle crouched to look down the hole where the boat had vanished. He stood up, wiping his paws and shaking his head. Flood tunnels. They're about as much use as an otter in a bird's nest. How far do you suppose they have filled up the lake under couture? A paw's height. A whisker's level. The abbess watched the rays of the setting sun through the trees. Who knows, Ben? One thing is certain, though. Coat here still stands, dark and evil as it ever was. What a shame that Formil and old Denny's plan never worked. They turned back to Brockhall. Bella says there's no likelihood of rain. The weather is staying fine, Ben added. Ferdy tugged the boat under his small spines. Maybe they should have done it. Maybe they should have done it in the winter, Ben, the abbess observed unhelpfully. Ben ruffled Ferdy's head. Maybe frogs should have had feathers. Come on, young'uns. Get your boats back to Brockhall and wash up for supper. It was a warm night. As the quorum sat about in the main room, an air of defeat hung over the company. Bella yawned, stretching in her deep armchair. Well, are there any more suggestions? There were none. The badger searched one face, then another. Then we must explore the possibilities open to us. But let me say this. I do not want to hear any more plans of mass attack or open war. Skipper and Lady Amber shifted uncomfortably. Formo and old Dinny still think the flooding will work if they can figure out some certain alteration to the original plan. I know a lot of us do not agree with this, but personally I think the flooding is our only hope. With that in mind, I propose we visit the site tomorrow. Maybe with all the quorum there we might come up with a good idea. If not... Then there is only one other sensible thing to do. Goody Stickle wiped her paws on her flowery apron. What might that be, Miss Bella? To move the woodlanders and everything we can carry away from here. We could travel east to Gingevere's new home. I have told you that he and Sandigom will accommodate us. We could find a welcome there, far away from Couture. Skipper jumped up, 
unhappiness written on his tough features. But that'd mean the cat has won! Cries of support rang out for the otter leader. Yes, why should we be driven out? We already left our homes to come to Brockhall. It wouldn't be the same in a strange place. I was born round here. I'm not moving. Abbas Germain banged a wooden bowl upon the table to restore order, but it broke in two. Silence, friends, please. Let Bella speak, she shouted above the din. Bella picked up the two halves of the bow and smiled ruefully at Germain. Thank you, Abbas. Friends, there is more to my plan than first meets the eye. If we were to make this move I am speaking of, then think of its effect upon Couture. Sarmina would not have won. She would not have chased us through the woods. We would have left of her own free will. Now what would it accomplish? Imagine for a moment if we stayed in the east until next summer or even spring. All the time we were gone, the water would continue to run down the flood tunnels. In autumn there is more rain and the wind drives the river faster. Winter would see the current run under the ice. And on warm days the snow would feed the river and swell it. Finally, when the thaw arrived in spring, the river waters would flood mighty and unchecked, and then we would truly see the lake arise beneath Cotier. One other thing. Between now and next spring, my father bore the fighter may arrive. He alone can face Sarmina and defeat her. That is all. I have spoken my peace. Formal rose and came to the table. Taking the two broken halves of the wooden bowl, he held them up. We be like this object. Split it up, we ain't much use. But if an us sticking together, and we am useful. <clears throat> he pressed the two halves together for all to see. Old Denny seconded him. For mo be right, Miss Bell. Tis wonderful mo sense. Columbine was allowed to her say. Let us do as Bella suggests. Tomorrow we will go to the flood tunnels. Then if nothing can be done, we will follow her plan. Immediate agreement followed. See, Columbine, the abbess said, picking up the broken bow in her frail, frail paws. Oh, and weak as I am, Yet somehow I managed the strength to perform a small bit of magic. Let us sleep now. It is late, and tomorrow we can tidy up here and wash the dishes. Oh, let's set this one. The abbess placed the broken halves carefully on the table. Maybe a lesson in mole logic would not be a bad thing for a wild cat queen to learn. Logalog was in his element as leader of his tribe once more. He roused the entire village an hour before dawn to get the ship underway. With a hundred extra shrews to help, Woodship fair flew, fairly flew along the river. When they were not rowing, they were punting, pushing, or hauling on ropes. Come on, shrews! Hoist sail! Logalog commanded. Two of you hold the tiller. Make yourselves busy. Double up on the oars there. You two in the cross trees. Stir your stumps. The chief is back. Let's show these bunny rabbits how to move a craft up of our river moss. I beg your pardon, old logger thing. Steady on with the name calling there, almighty leader. Indeed, we're hares, not bunny rabbits. Do you mind? T.B. sat on the deck, sharpening spikes. I'd lot these hairs, he remarked. Seasoned warriors, though, Martin said, as he counted swords and daggers. Boar the fighter taught them personally. Don't let their silly talk fool you. I wouldn't have them as an enemy at any price. And I was proud to fight alongside them against the sea rats. Gomp sniffed the air. His whiskers twitched in the pre-dawn darkness that shrouded the riverbanks. 
Trees, then. We must be in moss flower. Dawn will soon tell. The young mole was painting a crude sign to cover the name Bloodwake. It bore the legend Woodship. He shook his head admiringly, wiping paint from his paws. Er, Gonfin, we home again. I'm a-feeling it. The gruff voice of a shrew in the cross trees confirmed Dinny's words. Sun arise and eastward. Trees going close. We're in the forest. Keep her straight ahead, shouted Logalog, standing out forward. Throw those sails in before they snag on the branches. Lively there. Martin joined him at the prow. This rate we should make Camp Willow around midday. I never noticed us navigating that ford that crosses the path. Logalog panted the rail. I trenched it in the dark. Good sailor in sea. Old woodship skimmed the shallows with her flat bottom. Nice and deep here, though. Easy going on the oars. The sun rose above the woodland mist, revealing another hot summer day. Patterns of waterlight played along the bulkheads. Leaf and branch shadow mottled the decks. The oars pulled strong against the deep, slow current as the big ship nosed its course further into the depths of Mossflower. That brings us to chapter 45, which I believe we will save for Friday. Let me see how long it is. Yeah, I think that would push us out a little bit too long. Ah, the fall of Argular and Bane. <laughs> that seems to be a a repeated trope flash in in some of Brian Jake's Brian Jake's work, evil falling by evil, quite literally this time. <laughs> hey, there is Mora. She made it in. There is Mora. She made it in. Mora says, I caught the last ten minutes. I have a very busy evening. So, oh, well, I'll catch you guys tomorrow. Well, right now, we don't have a show on Wednesday. We might sneak one in on Thursday. It just depends on how it goes this week. We'll see how it goes, but we'll definitely have a show on Friday. Oh, that came out quite well, Flash. Very nice. Very, very nice. The Fall of Augular. Ah. Oh. oh, no. Oh, no. One of the, one of the slaves freed. Why, oh, he's all, he's all fur and sino, not a bit of fat on that poor mouse. Well, that's what you get for rowing at half rations, under the lash of the sea rats. All right, by the way, if you've enjoyed this artwork, our artist again is Elrod, Elrodimus Flash. And if you'd like to own any of his artwork... You can purchase the original artwork. You can purchase a print of any of his artwork for only $25 shipped in the United States. And you can commission him for custom work. Maybe you have an idea of a scene, a character, or something, and you would like to see it rendered in Flash's wonderful style. We'll get a hold of him on Twitter, at Hillrod Deluxe. Or you can reach him in our Discord server. And Flash is very good at getting back to people promptly. And uh, our Discord server is a pretty decent place, I must say. We have quite a few talented people among our members. With that said, with that said it is a pleasure to be able to perform and entertain for you. Hopefully you're all having a lovely night. And we hope to see you back on Let's see, Amy Lester said done. Uh, let me find out what done is. Did you share something, Amy? Doom, 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 doom,
Giddy up, giddy up, giddy up, let's go. Do, 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 do. Mm -hmm. Okay, I didn't see anything. I didn't see anything. So, Amy, if you shared, if you shared something, we'll make sure to show that uh, this coming Friday. This coming Friday. Yes, and by the way, if you need, if you need some coloring done, if you need a piece of artwork colored, please do. Don't hesitate to contact. Amy Lester, she does some wonderful coloring. All right. Hopefully we will we will see you back here all on Friday, but until then, God bless you and your families. Aloha and good night. Go to General, Edwin. Oh, go to General. It is let's see. Mm -hmm. da -da -da, da -da 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 I just went there and I didn't see anything. Right under your notice. Right under my notice. Ah. I see. I see. Let's see. Is that is that visible? Now let me let me open the original, and I'll share that screen. Ba ba bum ba ba bum ba ba bum 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 bum. Are you a are you a Silent Night guy or are you a White Christmas guy? Flash. Oh. That song from, uh, what's the creepy one from? The creepy one? Yeah, the creepy one from, uh, that movie with Macaulay Culkin. With Macaulay Culkin. <laughs> Home Alone. What's the creepy one from Home Alone? What's the creepy one? Somebody tell us in the chat what song he went. Is that Ave Maria, maybe? Uh-uh. <laughs> I don't think I've ever heard Ave Maria referred to as creepy, but I'm trying to think what else it could be. Let's see. Well, see if I can find it. Is, is that it? Oh, that's it. Oh, but why is it coming out so weird? Huh. There we go. See, is that visible? Oh, yes. Oh, that came out quite well. Quite well. Sea rats are flying. A war badger. A badger of war. <laughs> that scrawny little rat forearm with the spear snapping against boar's armor. Boar the fighter. And it looks like, it looks like, <laughs> Flash, did you draw Boar just, <laughs> just crushing a sea rat's skull? Yeah, he's pulling the guy's head, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like a basketball. And the, the arm coming up yeah. in the foreground is the other half of the arm of the striped shirt falling down. Mm. Like if the, if you embiggen the picture. From the original, <laughs> it's his arm. Very nice, very nice. Well drawn, flash, and well colored, Amy Lester. I still the, the favorite. My favorite part of the drawing, though, is just this one. <laughs> this one rat that's going flying in the <laughs> Just going flying in the background. No, it wasn't a good idea at the time. <laughs> I chose poorly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good stuff. Very nicely done. Very nicely done, Amy. All right. All right. Rox Rox Annabelle Cohen says, "I think it's an original score made for Home Alone." No idea what the name is. Hmm. We'll have to find out before the next program. All right. Thank you all for spending a part of a, your evening with Flash and myself. It is a privilege to be able to perform for you. And again, may God bless and keep you and your families until we meet again. Good night.